distinguished counselors of the International Teaching Centre, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you on behalf of the Youth Committee to tonight's talk on Hand of the Cause, George Townsend. The speaker tonight will be Mr. Tarazadeh, a member of the Universal House of Justice. I would just like to say a few things about Mr. Tarazadeh. He comes from a distinguished Baha'i family from Yazd in Iran. His father, Haji Mirza Muhammad Tahereh Malmiri, attained the presence of Baha'u'llah in Akka and stayed in Akka for a period of nine months. Mr. Tahirzadeh pioneered to Ireland in 1950 and he spent 38 years exactly in Ireland, exactly to the day, which happens to be twice 19. Um, Mr. Tarzade served on the British NSA and he was elected to the Irish NSA when it was formed in 1972. He was appointed a councillor in 1976 and was elected to the Universal House of Justice in 1988. George Townsend was appointed a Hand of the Cause in December 1951. He was part of the first batch of hands appointed by the beloved guardian. He died in March 1957, and it was between 1950 and 1957 that Mr. Tahirzadeh was a companion to George Townsend. 1,000 years ago, Ireland was known as the Island of Saints and Scholars. I like to think that George Townsend reawakened this identification by being a saint and scholar and that Mr. Tahirzadeh himself is one of the saints and scholars. So uh, I'll give you our speaker tonight, Mr. Tahirzadeh. Well, don't believe in everything you hear. (laughs) And, uh, but, uh, Well, it's marvelous to come here and meet with so many youth and, uh, oh, some youthful people also. <laughs> yeah. I feel that uh, you have chosen, I don't know how it has come about that you have chosen to hear about George Townsend, but I'm very glad that you have. I consider him as one of the greatest Baha'is. Uh, he's the greatest Baha'i I've ever seen, personally, amongst the Westerners, I'll be saying. Shoghi Effendi has described him as the greatest scholar in the West of the faith. And uh, as it was mentioned, he was appointed in the first, in the first contingent of the 12 hands of the cause that Shoghi Effendi first uh, appointed. The appointment of the first contingent. Uh, George Townsend was one of those 12 hands. Uh, It's very difficult for me to try to uh, talk to you about him because there are so many aspects to his life. And as it was mentioned, I had the great privilege, the great honor to be with him and really be with him for um, long times, long periods of times in Dublin, Ireland, for a period of seven years. And I consider those seven years as the most fruitful period in my life. Uh, Let me say something first of all about him being a scholar of the faith, a Baha'i scholar. I think (laughs) you must know that Baha'i scholarship 
is very different from the term that is used outside the Baha'i world as scholars on something. A Baha'i scholar never believes that he is a scholar. Do you see that? He never believes in his heart that he has got, he is the source of knowledge or greatness. Not, it never even dawns on him. This is the characteristic of a true Baha'i scholar. It is us who call him a scholar. He never, never refers to himself as such, never think about it. And so during these years, I would never perceive from George Townsend the slightest indication that he was a man of learning, that he was a great scholar. Never. It never came up, never showed itself. He would come across the most modest, the most humble person, and whenever you came in contact with him, you never thought that this man is a knowledgeable person. He would learn from a child. He was longing to learn from anyone. And he appeared when he, when he talked to you that he does not know a thing. Not that he was making it up, but that was genuine. Because, you know, this is a truth of the scholarship in the faith. This is the story of great scholars like Mirza Abul Faz and others. They reached the point that they knew they did not know anything, or very little. And that is where it's the height of knowledge of the of a Baha'i, uh, is that when he comes to the point that he is just a drop uh, against uh, an ocean. Uh, it's very true that, for example, now I'm just talking about somebody else, it doesn't matter, Mirza Abul Faz, because many people in the West who have known George Townsend and have studied his life, they say that he is the Mirza Abul Faz of the West, because in the East we say the greatest scholar of the faith so far has been Mirza Abul Faz, and in the West it was George Townsend. Mirza Abul Faz was the person who, uh, when Abdul Baha sent him to Europe, to, to Egypt, Abdul Baha told Mirza Abul Faz not to introduce himself as a Baha'i, but to teach the Quran and the Islam. And he taught it in such wise that after a few months, a great number of great learned scholars and divines of Islam used to come and sit at his feet to learn from him. And several of them came to the conclusion that he was some kind of a prophet. One of them went, some of them became Baha'is later on. And when they became Baha'is, and they came and met Abdul Baha, one of them went back to him and he said, before I went and met Abdul Baha, I thought you were the greatest person, I considered you as being a great prophet. But having seen Abdul Baha, you are just a drop as against the ocean. Mirza Abul Faz jumped and embraced him and he said, now you have recognized the truth. I'm just mentioning these stories so that these men of learning, like, Mr. like, Dr. like Mr. Townsend, uh, would never refer to himself as a scholar. If he, did, if he ever said anything to him, he would be upset. So friends, uh, now beginning with that sort of an introduction, uh, you know, he belonged to a very special um, type of people in Ireland, known as Anglo-Irish. The Anglo-Irish people, they were Protestants, because the majority of the Southern Irish people are, pro are Catholics. Great majority, they say, about 95%. Now, the Anglo-Irish, however, is their, their origin is really from England and Scotland in the 17th century. They came to Ireland, and they occupied a lot of land. They brought their landed gentry, as they say, their, their background, and they really dominated the entire country. George Townsend's father was an outstanding man, a great man of, uh, who was also a great known man amongst the landed gentry in Ireland. And uh, he was one of the founders of a very distinguished institution known as Royal Dublin Society. There's a lot of things about his background. George Townsend grew up 
in that atmosphere of greatness in the family. And then, uh, of course, it was customary in those days for uh, getting uh, his education. He was sent to England, he went to England, to Oxford. And it was just before the turn of the century uh, that he got his degree, he graduated from the university in Oxford. But he, um, and he distinguished himself in many ways that I don't want to go and talk about it, but his literary accomplishments are very outstanding. Uh, now let me write down <laughs> some of the things which comes to my mind from time to time. And... Um, You know that um, when he um, got his degrees, in those days now, uh, in Ireland, if, or in England, he found that he wanted something more. He wanted to go and, and look around the world. And so his father sent him. He said, anywhere you want to go. And he chose the United States. And so he went, George Thompson went to Utah, United States. And he, uh, there, he became a, he, he um, in 1904, actually, uh, he uh, became, he was a missionary amongst the Mormons, and then he was ordained in, as a priest in 1906. Uh, but during that period, he then was, he then started to, to teach in the university in the uh, Siwani, Tennessee University, University of the South, and he taught English literature, and he distinguished himself amongst uh, his colleagues. And there are many, many references to his distinguishing uh, characteristics, especially in the art, in the in the literature, and in his, uh, and also in the realms of virtues and qualities that he showed to the people. Uh, so, but after a while, and it was in 1916 now, that he decided that he could not really stay in England, in, in America, and he wanted to come back home to Ireland. So he went back home, and uh, uh, he became, he undertook... <laughs> first the duties of a curate in, in one of the areas in Dublin. But what happened to him, which was really miraculous, is that he visited a very well-known spot he liked in, the, in, in Dublin, in a hill outside Dublin. He used to go there during the time that he wanted to really be with God and to meditate. And he went there. And he had, of course, some American friends during that period who wrote to him and sent him two pamphlets about the faith. Now, I want to tell you this, that the pamphlets which were written in 1916 <laughs> is very different from what we write today about the faith. It was very uh, elementary. There were none of these writings of Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha available in English, translated. So it was very inadequate, you might say, um, pamphlets for anybody to read and understand something. And here is the greatness of George Thompson. I want to tell you this. I personally believe that there are some people in this life, in the faith, who are chosen by God to fulfill something, to fulfill a purpose. Now, George Thompson was not a person who um, would be persuaded by just re reading one or two little pamphlets and becoming a Baha'i. But he was. He read these two little pamphlets, and on that hill, he announced in his heart that he was, he had recognized Baha'u'llah as what? Not merely as the return of Christ, but as the coming of the Father. Can you imagine reading two pamphlets? That's why I'm saying he was chosen. And it is very true, as it was mentioned in here, that in the future he will be regarded. Nowadays the Irish people consider 
St. Patrick's to be the saint of the country. I'm sure in the future it will be George. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Now, he himself says, he wrote to Abdul Baha then, there and then. And he said to himself, he himself has expressed this. These are his own words. He said, when I looked at those, those pamphlets, that was the beginning and the end with me. Now, this is why I'm saying he was chosen. You do not become a Baha'i in that way. And, and he wrote to Abdul Baha, a beautiful poem, which is quite long, but I'll just read for you a few lines of it to see how he understood and recognized. He says, <laughs> and this man, uh, George Townsend, as I said, from the literary point of view, uh, he's outstanding in the faith amongst the writers. This is what Shoghi Effendi has said, and I will talk to you about it later on. Uh, some of you may have read some of his books. I don't know. I think you should if you haven't. He wrote to Abdul Baha, these are a few lines of this poem. Hail, O thee, Sion of glory. Thy words are to me as fragrant. No, sorry, I beg your pardon. He wrote to Abdul Baha first. And Abdul Baha wrote to him a tablet. And I will read part of this tablet translated into English, translated by Shoghi Effendi at the time. And this was in 1917, 1919 actually, this letter. Abdul Baha says, O thou who art thirsty for the fountain of truth, thy letter was received and the account of thy life has been known. Praise be to God that thou hast ever, like unto the nightingale, sought the divine rose garden, and like unto the verger of the meadow, yearned for the outpourings of the clouds of guidance. That is why thou hast been transferred from one condition to another until ultimately Thou hast attained unto the fountain of truth, hast illuminate, has illuminated thy sight, has revived and animated thy heart, has chanted verses of guidance, and has turned thy face towards the enkindled fire on the Mount of Sinai. At present I pray on thy behalf. Upon thee be Baha'u'l Abha. Now he writes then to Abdul Baha when he received this tablet, this poem. <laughs> Hail to thee, O Sion of, Sion of glory. Thy words are to me as fragrance born from the garden of heaven. Because of a lamp that is hid in the height of a holier world. Lo, thou hast breathed on my sorrows the sweetness of faith and of hope. Thou hast chanted high pians of joy that my heart's echoes ever repeat. And the path to the knowledge of God begins to glimmer and hope before my faltering feet. He received the second tablet from Baha, Abdul Baha then. <laughs> and this actually created a lot of tests for him, and I'll tell you about it later on. O oh, thou illumined soul and revered personage of, in the kingdom, your letter has been received. Every word indicated the progress and an upliftment of thy spirit and conscience. These heavenly susceptibilities of yours form a magnet which attracts the confirmations of the kingdom of God. And so the doors of realities and meanings will be open unto you and the confirmations of the, kingdoms of, God, of the kingdom of God will envelop you. And then he said something to him which confused him for a long many years. And I will tell you about it later on. He says, it's my hope that your church will come under the heavenly Jerusalem. I'll tell you about this later. Well, friends, this is how we see uh, George Townsend's embracing the faith in 1919 without anybody telling him anything, without knowing who else in the world of that day, in, the, in Britain, for instance, in Ireland, there was nobody who had recognized the faith. He was the first one there. But who was in England even? He did not know anybody. But he had already established his identity as a Baha'i with Abdul Baha'u. Now, 
he was, I must tell you about his uh, position as a, as a, as a clergyman, as a, as a minister of the church, church, uh, church of Ireland. The church of Ireland is a Protestant church. It's like the Church of England. There's the Church of Ireland. It's the same thing. He became a rector of Ahaskra. Ahaskra is a village outside Galway. Galway is in the west of Ireland. And this village um, offered him a church, and we have visited this church many times, that he used to preach there. And because of his standing there, because of his qualities, although the, 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 number of, the great majority of the people were Catholics, and although he was a Protestant minister, the Catholics used to come to him always for problems, for solution of their difficulties, and how they wanted to get spiritual guidance from him. They used to turn to him rather than going to their own priest, the clergyman. This is one of the interesting parts of his life. There he was given a huge mansion. Uh, I have visited that, the, the remnants of the, 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 that mansion uh, with him some stage he took me there to see it a huge place and he was of course having uh, servants and maids uh, which were given to him during that period and I mention these things because later on you see what happened to all of this this position that he had he had a very important position he became because Abdul Baha has said that um, I hope that thy church will come under the heavenly Jerusalem he thought and this is the point. He thought for many years, many, many years, that uh, the, the faith of Baha'u'llah, which he knew is the faith which is being born by Baha'u'llah, and he was the father, the coming of the father. The father has come, he said. And he thought that the coming of the father will cleanse the church and revive it. And that's why he thought Abdul Baha says thy church will come under the heavenly Jerusalem so he remained in the church and he tried to tried to do things to encourage the, the development the spiritual development of the church and this was his problem and he had this problem even till 1940s or a long time In the old days, you see, Baha'is did not have many inf much information about the faith as we have today. Look at what we have today. Look at the ocean of information that we have. Not only talking about the writings of Baha'u'llah, the writings of Abdul Baha, the writings of Shoghi Effendi, uh, the, the guidance of the House of Justice, all the other things that we know about the faith. It's an ocean we have. In those days, there was none of these things. Very little. Just a tablet from Abdul Baha. A man alone and single living in the west of Ireland. Being a, remain, he is a Baha'i. He recognizes Baha'u'llah. And then he begins to think for himself how he should go ahead. And how he should continue. So he continued in the, search, in the church. And he eventually became... The, uh, he, was, he, was, he was elected as one of the eight of all Ireland. He was elected as the canon of St. Patrick's Cathedral, which is a very prestigious church in Ireland, the, the Irish, the, 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 the Church of Ireland. Canon of St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin. He used to go to this place every year, he said to me, every year he had to go there two or three weeks or maybe a month uh, to give a sermon in this, in this church. In the, in the, in the, but his home was in Ahaskra in the county of the Galway. And this was where his church was. He also was, became an archdeacon, archdeacon of Clonfort. And his name went to be uh, announced as a bishop, one of the bishops. But then he, re he, he uh, rejected this for some personal reasons that I don't want to go into. So now, during this period, at the same time that he was a Baha'i, at the same time that he was um, teaching in the church as a, as a, as a clergyman, he wrote his first book called The Altar on the Heart. And some of these contents actually appears in a book called The Mission of Baha'u'llah, which he wrote later on. And you should read these things. This Mission of Baha'u'llah is a tremendous, uh, is full of essays that he has written. And uh, it's, no, it's not 
easy for me to go and talk about these things at this present time because of the shortage of time. Now he was known as being the only Baha'i in Ireland for many years. And from the very beginning of the ministry of Shoghi Effendi in 1921-22, Shoghi Effendi wrote to him. And uh, in those days, Shoghi Effendi was involved in um, translating the writings of Baha'u'llah and, uh, you know, the Kitab Iran, the Gleanings, later on, the Epistle to Son of the Wolf, and all the other writings that Shoghi Effendi translated. He also, Shoghi Effendi was at that time involved with writing um, the Dawnbreakers, because the Dawnbreakers that we have is not just a mere translation of Nabil's narratives. The Dawnbreakers is an edited version of what Nabil has written in, in his notes. Shoghi Effendi had to write it, edit it, and produce it as what we call it today, the Dawnbreakers. Now, what Shoghi Effendi used to do, he used to send his, his translations uh, to George Townsend in the early days of his ministry, from the early days of his ministry and saying, please look at these translations. And if you find any, I would appreciate if you could give me your views about it, if you want to make any corrections about my English, do it. And so this was involved in this. He never said of this function to anybody. I did not know it until towards the end of his life, although I was very close to him and he used to tell me everything. He thought perhaps if you say this, this will be a kind of boasting to say that Shoghi Effendi is sending all his writings to me and then he was to look at it from the English point of view. But he told me this when he said this to me. He said, you know, he said Shoghi Effendi's writings is divinely guided. He said no person who has come from that background, which is not an English background. After all, you know, Shoghi Effendi was brought up here on, in the Holy Land amongst the Arabs and the Baha'i and the Persian culture and the Persians. He studied, um, this was his language, this was his mother language was Persian. His mother language was not English. He learned, as he went to college here in Beirut. He went to England to perfect his English but he couldn't continue his studies because Abdul Baha passed away. And he used to tell me, he said, this, it's not possible for a person of that background to be able to write such English unless it is divinely guided. We used to talk together about this. At least my, my way of looking at it was, and we often said to each other, I said, you know, I think the Kitab e Iran, which is revealed by Baha'u'llah in Persian, again Baha'u'llah has re revealed it in English through the work of Shoghi Effendi. It's a superb translation. But what did George Townsend say about his part in this? He said, writings of Shoghi Effendi is such that it's like somebody who builds a house with bricks. You know, you put brick over brick over brick and you make a house. He said, yes, it is complete. He said, there is no room to put any word in it to improve it. You can't push another brick into it. And he says, if you take one of the bricks out, the whole, the whole building will collapse. He said, what could I do? Very little. And of course, what he did, he used to maybe punctuate these things for Shoghi Effendi, uh, make new paragraphs for him, because Shoghi Effendi would write, from the beginning to the end, there was no paragraphing, no punctuation. <laughs> so this is probably his work. And he did it. He never said this to anyone, that this was his work. When Shoghi Effendi went to Oxford, to, he went several times to Oxford to finish this work of the Nabil's narratives. And it was Shoghi Effendi's custom. Whenever he left the Holy Land, 
he would never contact he would never contact any believer uh, outside so he used to um, work on Nabil's narrative in Oxford using various libraries and facilities there when he was translating Nabil's narrative and editing it he wanted to send some parts of it to George Townsend he used to send it to Haifa and from Haifa it would be posted to George Townsend although he was in Oxford very close to, to George Townsend this was the way that always correspondence went from the World Center Shoghi Effendi always said that correspondence whenever Shoghi Effendi went for instance for other trips when he went to Switzerland in the summer never he wrote a letter from there to anybody and posted it to him it always would come to the Holy Land it's from the world center of the faith that the center of the faith the head of the faith will communicate from the world center you see this is a very important principle George would say I did not know that George that, that George that Chogi Effendi was in Oxford at the time he said, I did not know anything I used to receive these materials from him and then when Shoghi Effendi translated Dawnbreakers, he said to him to write a, uh, an introduction to it. The introduction to Dawnbreakers is by George Townsend. But he suggested that he will not want his name to appear. So that uh, it is just um, without any name there. It may be now in the ne next edition, in the future editions, or even the present editions, they may have added name to it now. Now, uh, one of the things that he did was, for instance, the writing of God Passes By. When Shoghi Effendi wrote God Passes By, which is the history of the faith, he used to send the, these typewritten pages to Georgetown and to Dublin during the war very difficult in those days to send things by post and George Townsend used to produce it in such a way that it could be ready for printing in other words paragraphs punctuations chapters and so he worked for it in that way and it was eventually sent to America to be printed in time for the 100th anniversary of the faith in 1944 Again, he wrote, an, art, he wrote a, an introduction. You'll see when you see God Passes By, it's an introduction by George Thompson. And I'll tell you a story about it because it's very interesting. Um, George used to live in a little... In those days, uh, where he was living was outside the city of Dublin, quite a long distance out. Nowadays, it's all joined together. The, country, the town has become one big metropolis. And he used to have a bicycle, he used to ride on it. He also had a car, but he seldom took the car out. And, but he usually used the bicycle. And Shoghi Effendi, when he finished God Passes By, he told George Townsend, please give a name to this book. Because this is the only book that Shoghi Effendi has written. Shoghi Effendi has not written any other books. The other books that you see are attributed to him, such as The World Order of Baha'u'llah, The Citadel of Faith, and so many other volumes that you can buy, the Baha'i administration, this is not a book. These are letters that Shoghi Effendi has written, and these letters are put together by the National Assembly and published. So it's a compilation of his letters. It's not a book. The book that he wrote, the only book that he wrote, was God Passes By, which is the history of the faith. So then he said to George Townsend, he said, give a name to it. And George was telling me, he said, I did not know what to do, I forgot, I didn't pay much attention, not much attention, but he just left it, as you say, on the long finger. Not, did not, not didn't do anything about it. And so, Shoghi Effendi sent a message again saying, give an end to it, expedite. He said, I did not know what to do, nothing came to his mind, and he was sitting there, and so, Message after message came that he should give a name to this book. <laughs> now, in those days, the only post office which was working and reliable and the only thing was in the middle of the city of Dublin. It was the general post office. He was living about 10 miles away, more. So he said, okay, well, I must send a telegram to Shoghi Effendi, give a name to this book. What shall I call it? So he got on his bicycle and he went towards the 
general post office, not knowing what the name of the book is going to be. On the way, he said, God passes by. Marvelous name. Now, those of you, I'm sure you all know English. It's a, it is a phrase which cannot be translated into any language. <laughs> really and truly, you try it. You know what means God passes by? What it means when somebody passes by you? So many things attached to it. It's not just that God has come. God passes by. A person who passes by you, you won't notice him even. He passes by you. You notice, you realize it later on. It's a marvelous name that he gave to it. Shoghi Effendi was delighted with this name. <laughs> so he goes to the post office and he sends this tele telegram. God passes by. So here we are. This is something about his uh, contribution to the work of the holy writings. His contribution is inestimable, what he has done to Shoghi Effendi. And the trust that Shoghi Effendi had in him was enormous. And the letters that he wrote to him, the letters that Shoghi Effendi has written to George Townsend, is full of praise and glorification of his work and functions. He never shared these letters with anybody, including his family. He just kept it to himself. Because it's full of praise and full of uh, admiration for the work he was doing. This is the quality of a person who really is a true believer. He doesn't go and uh, blow his own trumpet as some people do. Now, one thing happened in 1936 that I want to tell you in the life of George Townsend. Uh, the British, in those days, the British Empire, uh, they used to have, uh, from time to time, called conferences of religions in the British Empire. And in 1936, uh, the Council of Churches or whatever it was, they decided that they wanted to have representatives from all faiths in the British Empire to come to London and to read their paper, read the paper there. It's a conference. So they wrote a letter to Shoghi Effendi as the head of the Baha'i faith, who was also, after all, in the British Empire of the time, in here, Palestine of those days was part of the British mandate, invited him to come to this conference. Shoghi Effendi wrote a paper and he gave it, he sent to George Townsend, who was then canon of St. Patrick's Cathedral and the Archdeacon of Clonfert, dressed up in his gowns, you know, the way these gowns of the priests are. And he said to him, you represent the Baha'is. Well, George Townsend took it on with his robes and clerical robes. He came to London and he went to this conference. And it's very interesting that the beginning of the, when the time came for the Baha'i representatives to read his paper, the chairman of the meeting was Sir Herbert Samuel, who was a close friend of Abdul Baha, a very great admirer of Abdul Baha. And he began to talk about the greatness of the faith, the, the wonderful teachings, talked about the person of Abdul Baha, and he even intimated that later on, that if he was not a politician, he would consider himself as a Baha'i. So, with this introduction, George Thompson read his paper. That brought the wrath and the indignation of the clergy, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the Protestant clergy, to think that a clergyman in the Church of Ireland, churchman, should come and to pronounce these things on this historic place. And so there is going to be a lot of publicity against the faith about this article in the next morning newspapers. And George Townsend was afraid that now that's the end of his work as a, ch as a churchman, that he's going to be um, uh, sent home. That's it. It could be uh, because the opposition was very great. But providence here... <laughs> brought out a kind of a miracle which meant that it didn't appear as a headline in the newspapers. In fact, it appeared as a little, a little, because the whole nation's attention was drawn to something completely different the next morning. You may have heard King Edward VIII, 
The next morning that was supposed, this was supposed to come out, King Edward VIII abdicated because he married Mrs. Simpson. And this meant he had to abdicate. The newspapers from beginning to the end was full of the stories of the king abdicating. Can you imagine? <laughs> Nothing happened then about George Townsend and everything else. However, uh, I remember that uh, he was telling me uh, himself that uh, for years uh, that there was something that he could not understand. As I told you, this question of the, leaving the church. Uh, he, he never thought he'll have to leave the church, as I told you, because Abdul Baha has said he prays that this church will come under the heavenly Jerusalem. <laughs> it meant something different, but he took it wrongly. So, um, in those days, uh, the Americans who went on pilgrimage uh, were able to fly. In those days, flights were not like now that you can fly from one part of the world to the other. The airplanes had limited range, and by then, in 1930s, uh, it was able for an American flight to start from America to New York, say. And the first place, in order to come to Europe, the first place that it would land was in Ireland because it was the first area, land. They would come to Shannon Airport, which is not very far from Galway where George Thompson used to live. And so it meant that any pilgrim who was going to the, to the Holy Land, he would come first to Ireland, he would stay there for some time, We'll meet with George Thompson, the only Baha'i then in that part of the world, then go to the Holy Land, come back again to Ireland, meet with Shoghi Effendi, tell him what had happened in Haifa and what Shoghi Effendi had said, and then go back home. He said to me, several of these pilgrims came in 1930s now, and said to me that Shoghi Effendi has said that one day George Thompson has to resign from the church. He said, I don't understand why. This was completely, um, mist it was mystified by this because his understanding was different. And he left it like this. But gradually he realized. The more he read the writings, the more he read the writings of Shoghi Effendi and the writings of Baha'u'llah, which were then being translated, he realized that that phrase in that tablet of his has a meaning. And he realized that the fate of Baha'u'llah it's going to be an independent, it's not going to cleanse the churches and re-establish the churches, but it's an independent faith. And so he threw himself into the faith, and he wanted then to become, to, to resign from the church, even as far as late as 1940, early 1940s. He wanted to resign, but then there were problems. The first problem, by the time, by the time, by the way, in this meantime, he had written another book which is very well known, The, the Heart of the Gospel and another one called The Promise of All Ages. These books are available, you can read them. Uh, the Heart of the Gospel is a marvelous book you can give to a Christian. If you want to introduce the faith to a Christian, that's a marvelous way of explaining the faith, explaining what Christianity really is, so that his, his understanding of Christ becomes clear before he becomes a Baha'i. The Promise of All Ages, of course, is a very clear um, uh, history of the faith and so forth. So then, now, what happens? He meets with some of the British Baha'is during this period, become familiar with them. There are very few Baha'is in those days in Britain, very few. And uh, he realizes that he has to eventually resign from the church. Now, I must tell you here the obstacle he had, and one of the greatest obstacles was that his, his family life, he was married to a very wonderful person who also belonged to this landed gentry of Irish. And as I said, they used to live in a mansion. I, I have a feeling they had about maybe four or five servants in that household and maids. And Mrs. Townsend uh, never, had the never had the opportunity to even, say, make a cup of tea for somebody. It was all done for her by this system of servants and maids who were doing this thing. And she was, uh, in those days, you know, uh, it was very obvious that this family were from a, a noble um, class, shall we say, of people. It was a class of nobility, really. And in such a class, um, the, 
it's very important to hold on to the conventions of the time and not to suddenly come out and break uh, away from the, from, this, from the customs and the habits of the country. You have to always observe the customs and the conventions of the time that you're living in, especially for a family like this. So Mrs. Townsend, although he knew about Baha'u'llah, he knew about her husband's um, involvement with the faith, she was very much uh, against him coming out and resigning or saying, in fact, publicly that he was a member of the Baha'i faith. Because that would be a great embarrassment for her. And uh, so there was a great deal of um, opposition here in that sense. And of course, George Townsend always wanted to keep the unity of the family. But he used to pray that God may find a way for him, that he could one day be able to resign with honor and come out and try to teach the faith and become independent. So what happened was that uh, uh, in, in 1946 or 47, early 47, Shoghi Effendi sent a message to the British NSA, British National Assembly, saying, Townsend resignation imperative. Can you imagine now? Townsend resignation imperative. He must resign. <laughs> At that very moment that this cable came, you see the, how they, the words of Shoghi Effendi cre was creative. Somebody in India, a, a clergyman in India, came across the book called Promise of All Ages, written by George Townsend, underneath it, Canon of St. Patrick's Cathedral and Archdeacon of Clonfert. So he becomes angry, this clergyman, in, this Protestant clergyman in, in India who is teaching the Indians. Uh, he's a missionary, one of the Christian missionaries. He becomes very angry about this. He writes a letter to the Archbishop of Canterbury, which is the head of the Protestant church in England. Send this book with him and say, look at this. This is a disgrace. This man has written a book about the faith of Baha'u'llah and this book is used in India uh, by the Baha'is to teach the people to their faith. Now, just, just at the time that Shoghi Effendi said that his, his resignation is imperative, Well, Archbishop of Canterbury sent this letter with the book to the Archbishop of Armagh, who is the head of the church in Ireland. And the Archbishop of Armagh sends it to the head of, this, of the St. Patrick's Cathedral, where George Townsend was the canon of. And he was a close friend of George Townsend. So this man, this head of this church in Ireland, calls George Townsend and he says, look what have I got. You have written this book, look at all this protestation here from the clergyman, and what can we do? Well, he said, what do you expect me to do? He said, you write a little note to refute this book. Say that I didn't mean it, or I've written it, I ignore it, or I refute it. He said, I can't do that. He said, then you have to resign. Then, of course, this head of the church knew that uh, he did not want to lose George Thompson. He wanted to persuade him. So he decided to call his wife and Mr. Thompson together. And together, they were supposed to solve this problem, wanting to put pressure by bringing Mrs. Thompson into it. So, after discussions, this head of the church says to George, to, to the, both of them, that you know, the only way out of it is that you should write a letter of recantation. The, otherwise, you have to resign from the church. Mrs. Townsend becomes very angry. He says, what are you saying? My husband to write a letter of recantation, already he has written these things, to go and deny it? This will be not honorable? George, you should resign. <laughs> That is more honorable than just recanting what you have written. See? So, this was how it was. And it was in 1947 that he resigned from the church. 
And what a resignation. Shoghi Effendi said, wrote to him, he said, Dear and valued co-worker, I am thrilled by the news of your resignation. <laughs> a truly remarkable and historic step. Your past and notable services, your bold and challenging act at present in dissociating yourself from the church and its creed to accomplish better the purpose of that church and your subsequent resolve to pioneer in Dublin and help in establishing the administrative basis of the Baha'i New World Order in Ireland are, in, are deeds that history will record and for which future generations will be deeply grateful and will extol and admire. Now this resignation from the church was not a simple thing. He wrote this booklet called The Old Churches and the New World Faith. This is the, this is the boldest proclamation of the faith ever made, I think, by the Christian, by a Christian. I wish you would get this, read it, and see what challenging statements is in this book. It's not an ordinary thing that he just wrote. And that's how it begins. It said, by George Townsend, sometimes Canon of St. Patrick's Cathedral, Dublin, and the Archbishop of the Clonton. Sometimes. Now this is what he says. Having identified myself with the faith of Baha'u'llah and sacrificed my position as a canon and a dignitary of the Church of Ireland that I might do so, I now make this statement on the relation of this faith to Christianity and to the Churches of Christ. It is submitted to all Christian people in general, but more especially to the bishops and clergy and members of my own communion, with a humble and, but earnest and urgent request that they will give in their attention as a matter of vital concern to the Church. Only through an impartial investigation of the cause of Baha'u'llah will they find, I fully believe, a means of reviving the fortunes of the Church, of restoring the purity and the power of the Gospel, and of helping to build a better and more truly Christian world. And he goes on to talk about Baha'u'llah. And he describes how Baha'u'llah has written to the Christians, followers of the Gospel, he quotes Baha'u'llah, explain Baha'u'llah addressing the whole of Christendom, followers of the Gospel, behold the gates of heaven are flung open. You see, he just is proclaiming to them. He hath ascended unto it, he that hath ascended unto it is now come. Give ear to his voice, calling aloud over land and sea, announcing to all mankind the advent of this revelation. And then he goes on to talk about his letters to the Pope, uh, how he said to the Pope, the things he said to him, he said, um, Lo, the Father is come, Baha'u'llah's word, and that which ye were promised in the kingdom is fulfilled. He writes to the Pope and he says, Arise in the name of the Lord, the God of mercy, amidst the peoples of the earth, and seize thou the cup of life with the hands of confidence, and first drink thou therefrom, and prefer it then to such as turn towards it amongst the peoples of all faiths. He says, Sell all the embellished ornaments thou dost possess, and expend them in the path of God. Abandon thy kingdom unto the kings, and emerge from thy habitation. This is the words of Baha'u'llah addressed to the Pope. And then he goes on to say, there is so much about other aspects of the, it's all challenging. And then at the end, I read the last, or the penultimate paragraph, or the last paragraph, the penultimate, one of the last paragraph. You see? He says, the Baha'i faith today presents the Christian churches with the most tremendous challenge ever offered them in their long history. Listen to his words. The Baha'i faith today presents the Christian churches with the most tremendous challenge ever offered them in their long history. A challenge and an opportunity. It is the plain duty of every earnest Christian in this illumined age to investigate for himself with an open and fearless mind the purpose and the teachings of this faith and to determine whether the collective center for all the constructive forces of this time be not the messenger from God, Baha'u'llah, he and no other. <laughs>
and whether the way to a better, kinder, happier world will not lie open as soon as we accept the announcement our rulers rejected. Because he talks about rulers. And then he quotes Baha'u'llah's words, O kings of the earth, he who is the sovereign lord of all is come. Now you see what a magnificent, challenging statement that he sent to the peoples. And then in those days the, the Baha'i community of England, the National Assembly, printed 10,000 copies of this. 10,000. And George Townsend wanted particularly for, these, for this message to reach to all the clergymen, in the, in the, in the, especially the Anglican clergymen. 10,000 copies to every bishop, every priest, every well, parson, whoever it was, that there was a religious man. George Thompson again had another misconception at that time, which again was realized later on, he realized it. And it is this, that he wanted to send this to the clergy, so that the clergy may, may, may awaken and become believers. So 10,000 copies went. And I know one copy also went to King George VI. And uh, the National Assembly received a message from his secretary saying that this pamphlet was placed on the desk of the king. That's as far as it went. But these 10,000 clergy, what did they do? Not one of them answered it. One or two maybe answered in a peculiar way. And George Thompson was very disappointed. So he wrote to show he offended. And he said how disappointed he was. Shoghi Effendi sent him a very simple message. He said, what do you expect when you knock on tombs? <laughs> they are dead. The clergy is dead. So that was another vision of George Townsend which was clarified for him. Now he, of course, was the great... When Shoghi Effendi in 1951 appointed him as the hand of the cause, he was so puzzled. I remember a time that he used to come and tell me, he said, I, when I became a Baha'i, and years later on, when I grew up in the, grew in the faith, I rebelled against administration. Because he said, I was fed up with the administration in the church. And I thought the coming of Baha'u'llah will relieve us of all this. And then he said, I understood that we are having an administration. And he said, I rebelled against it. But he understood it soon. I remember he used to talk to me quite a lot about this. We used to talk a great deal about Shoghi Effendi, about the building of the administrative order, about the covenant. Days and days and hours and hours. And gradually he realized. And then Shoghi Effendi appointed him as a hand of the cause, the first contingent. And it was then that he wrote his masterpiece, Christ and Baha'u'llah. He wrote this at a time that he had now, been, he was, his health was deteriorating. He had developed Parkinson's disease. He couldn't talk properly. He couldn't write properly. And he had great difficulty in, in dictating his words to his daughter, who used to take down for him very great difficulties. But he finished that work. It's a masterpiece of his work. It's really Christ and Baha'u'llah, challenging and most wonderful statements that he has made there. Now, he became so filled with the understanding of the faith of Baha'u'llah. But as I said, he, was, he would never show that he knew anything. He always wanted to learn from anybody. Now I'll tell you some of the things which uh, may be uh, a different, uh, maybe if I can take another 10 minutes, or are you tired? Uh, uh, you see, these are some of the personal things I want to tell you about him, and uh, we'll see what it is. Uh, in those days, when he, left, when he left the church, as I said, he was living in the utmost comfort with all the maids and servants around him. Now he gave it up. Shoghi Effendi had said to the British National Assembly that they should, um, they should try to... Uh, because what happened when he resigned from the church, the church took away from him his pension and everything. 
not only that house that he was living in, that mansion, but also the pension. So he was penniless. And Shoghi Effendi said it's now the duty of the National Assembly to sustain and to look after the family of the Townsend. I should have also told you that when George Townsend resigned from the faith, and he pioneered to Dublin really, to form the local, to become part of the local assembly there, his wife, Nancy, decided in loyalty to her husband, she would also join the faith, just to be loyal to her husband. And when her husband passed away, she reverted back again to Christianity. This was her type of life. Now, George Townsend came to Dublin with the British NSA now supposed to look after him financially. In those days, the British NSA had very little resources financially. So Shoghi Effendi said that uh, the National Assembly of Iran and the United States should combine together their forces to provide financial assistance to the Townsend family. Can you imagine? One family in the world had to be sustained by the force of the United States and Persia putting their money together and trying to. And so they did that. They bought a small little bungalow for them in Dublin, outside Dublin. A small little bungalow, three bedrooms. These people were, Mrs. Thompson was completely lost and couldn't believe it that she was coming from that mansion with all the maids and servants into a little tiny little hole you can say and now who is going to look after them she had never been able to cook a meal for anybody she had never been able to make a cup of tea for someone and it was here that George Townsend that his advanced age used to work in the kitchen for a long time working there it's a great sacrifice and Jogi Fendi says that he hopes that George Townsend will be able to earn some money from, writing his writing, from his writings. But of course, these writings would never bring some money really in the long run for anybody. So the National Assembly in that way uh, supported the Townsend family. Very modest, very modest life. Very modest. Now, he used to live in the outside, this is outside Dublin in those days, although nowadays it's part of the city, but in those days it was far away. And Mrs. Townsend was not used to having Baha'is to come to her house. She was not used to the type who would get anybody to come to meet with them. She would not associate with people in that way. So she, the house was closed and they were, nobody could visit them in that way. And um, they used to come to the meetings, which we held in other places. But we could not go to their home. Because of the conditions at the time, I mean, she would never be able to entertain anybody. She would be absolutely lost. How can she do it? I was younger in those days, and I used to do um, a little bit of, um, I don't do it nowadays, uh, electrical work. I used to go to their house once or twice to repair one of the little heaters they had, and maybe um, cut a little bit of lawn for them. So I became gradually popular with Mrs. Townsend. <laughs> and I would be allowed to go in from time to time to help, you see. So this was a one marvelous beginning. And I used to go there quite often. But um, I had to again make sure that I wouldn't overdo it. And every time I went there, because they were living in the country side, outside Dublin, I had to get a bus. And then when we finished, George Townsend would walk with me to the bus stop. He always wanted to prolong my stay with him because he was longing for Baha'i fellowship. So we would go to the bus stop and he would say to me, I hope you'll miss this bus because there will be another hour, <laughs> another hour of waiting, you see, because buses were so infrequent in those days. <laughs> so this is how it was. During the daytime, he used to come to Dublin from the outskirts. Uh, and the excuse was that he wanted to buy some, for instance, butter. Uh, so he would come to town, he would ride on his bicycle, come to our place, leave his bicycle there, and we used to go for half a day, um, if I was not working at the time, 
uh, or if I was working, he would come at times that I was free, and we would go, if it was a good weather, into the park, we would sit down there and talk about the faith. If not, we would go to some place, sit down, have a cup of tea for hours, and then he would go to this little shop, buy half a pound of butter, put it on a bicycle, go home. <laughs> the next day he would come for a loaf of bread. <laughs> <laughs> and his wife would be very happy to see that these uh, messengers are coming around. So you see, in those days, our community, uh, that of course there were times that he was so lonely, that, um, and it was particularly during the time that he used to have this Parkinson's disease in, in becoming stronger and stronger for him. He um, used to uh, pick up the telephone and uh, when there was nobody around the house and he would telephone me and say, come tonight and put the telephone down. <laughs> so I knew that uh, just really is lonely and I would go there again and uh, try to do something for them in the house. So this is how we used to carry on. Now he used to come and go to every meeting that we had. We used to have firesides. He never missed the fireside. Even if it was in the middle of snow or sleet or cold or warm, he would always be there. And in those days, the firesides were very few people coming into it. For years and years, nobody joined the faith. From 1950 until 1968, 18 years, not one single person became a Baha'i during that period. It's a very difficult, tough, tough time. It was a time that uh, pioneers would come and help us to maintain the assemblies. There was one assembly in Dublin, and Shoghi Effendi said that assembly has to be held by all costs. At all costs, he called it the pivotal center in the British Isle, one of the pivotal centers, and he wanted... So pioneers would come, a few months live there, form the local assembly, see that the local assembly is maintained, and go back again. This was our condition. And when I first went to Dublin, as a member of the Baha'i community, the Baha'i community was very small. There were about eight or nine people altogether in the whole country. And I remember his wife was a Baha'i, his daughter and son were Baha'is, George Townsend himself, there were already four of them. And uh, there were there three or four others who had been also joined the faith without knowing what the faith was all about. They had just come in, just for peculiar reasons, maybe they thought it's a club they were joining. Anyhow, they were, they were in the Baha'i community. <laughs> in, the, yeah, in the early days of the faith, always it's the same thing. The local assemblies in the early days have been very weak. You must not expect local assemblies to be strong at first. This is how it is. When you, when you put the seed down in the ground, if you go and examine that seed, after a week or so, you'll see it's rotten. Nothing in it. But from that rotten seed which is rotten, it will eventually comes out a tree and becomes a huge tree. At first, these institutions are very weak. Even today, many of our local assemblies are weak. It's like it's embryonic because it's em the faith is growing in its embryonic days. It's not something that the, our institutions of the faith are not strong. They're going to make a lot of mistakes. We must not expect that our institutions are going to make the right decisions. Yes, I know the House of Justice is different. It is guided by Baha'u'llah. If it wasn't, it would also make a lot of mistakes. But our local assemblies, our national assemblies, are in the state of infancy, childhood, or even embryonic growth. So we cannot expect perfection from them. But we expect to be healthy. So there are weaknesses all over. You come across local assemblies today, there are nine people there, half of them are not interested, they don't come, they don't go, they do all kinds of things. But yet it is held together. It's the seed germinating. And eventually it will come. In Dublin, it was like this. When I first went there, the local assembly was the weakest I've ever seen. But now, today, we have a Baha'i community, a strong national assembly, wonderful community, wonderful people. In those days, now I'll tell you, the first day that uh, we arrived, a few days, uh, two or three days later, George Townsend came along. Of course, he, as soon as we arrived, he came to the ship and took me to the uh, place where we were to stay. And... Um, there was a great deal of unemployment in those days and in Ireland. A great deal of unemployment. Every night, three ships would carry young people from Ireland to England to get jobs. 
In that time, I had come to Ireland as a pioneer wanting to get a job. And a Persian, I mean, it's very different. If you were German, if you were a specialist in something, I, I was nothing. Just coming to get a job. And Shoghi Effendi assured us that we will, I will get a job, I'll succeed. But anyhow, so I had no doubt about it, but it was difficult. So the first scene that, that welcomed me when I first came to Dublin was this. George Thompson came to the ship, took all our belongings in the car, and we drove to this guest house that we were to stay. On the way, in the middle of the town, we were stopped because the unemployed were, were, making, uh, represent, were making demonstrations. They would sit in the, in the street for an hour, would not let any car to pass through as a protest. That was the scene which welcomed me, going into the country to get a job. <laughs> and so eventually, I don't go into the details of it, of how I got it. But anyhow, two or three days later, he came along and he said, he said to me, we are having a meeting here and we want to, all the friends want to meet with me and with us to, to, to see how it is. I said, okay. He said, we are meeting in a cafe, a well-known cafe in Dublin. Um, and he said, um, I'll call for you. So we went together. He said, by the way, it's all men. Uh, we will not bring women uh, members uh, to this cafe. Uh, it's just men, members of the Baha'i community, meet together. And in those days, cafes had a room which was for men only. Uh, you would go to a cafe there, there was a certain part which was for men only, and we used to go into this men only section. So there were five or six Baha'is there, and I was supposed to be the new person, tell them something. Or... So George Thompson came quietly and he said, uh, They expect you to say something, but don't talk about Christ or Muhammad or Moses. Because Mr. Walsh, one of our believers, doesn't believe in them. <laughs> and he said he has, a, he has a very hot temper and he could, it would be a great controversy and so better not to say it. He said also, he said also, I wouldn't advise you to say much about what Baha'u'llah because uh, Mr. Price believes that we must not m mention Baha'u'llah because you create personalities in the faith. So he does not want to bring the word Baha'u'llah. I said, so what do you say? He said, we say he. <laughs> or we say him. What did he say? Oh yes, he said this and that. So this was the condition of the Baha'i community in those days. Gradually, one by one of these people, of course, fell away or were eventually uh, had to leave the faith. They realized this was not a place for them. And so we depended then on pioneers to come from outside. Uh, the pioneers would come from England and uh, stay there for a few months and then go back home. And so that is how the Baha'i community, the local assembly of Dublin, was maintained for many, many years until gradually one or two people became Baha'is. And then the, f the floods came in Limerick uh, in 1970 when uh, great numbers came into the faith. This was another episode, which one day you might ask Leslie to tell you because she was there, uh, the instigator of all of this in those days. So here we are. Uh, George Townsend passed away in 1957 a few months before the passing of Shoghi Effendi. And we had, uh, the funeral was take, took place in, uh, in the church, uh, in the Church of Ireland. We managed to get from the, uh, from the minister permission to bury him there in accordance with Baha'i rights and not with the Christian rights. It's very strict there, you see, in a country which is so religious. And had a very great job to make the minister of the church to agree that we could bury him in his church without having anything to do with the, with the Christian rites. And the person, in my must say, the person who defended him and who brought about this possibility that the minister eventually agreed was his wife. His wife courageously went there, talked to this minister and said, my husband has given his life for this faith. He has written these books about the faith. He has been one of the leading figures of this faith. And do not interfere in this. Let us bury him and he's... So, eventually, they said, okay. So, we will manage to uh, have a Baha'i funeral in the church there where he's buried. 
uh, although later on the, the Protestant uh, church, especially in Australia, they wrote articles to say that George Townsend, towards the end of his life, had recanted and he, was there, he had a Christian burial. This was refuted later on by his son and his daughter, who published uh, refu uh, re refuting this. So now here is, uh, I just told you a few of these um, accounts and remembrances. But I want to tell you that maybe I'll read for you the message of the Guardian uh, when, Shoghi Effendi, when George Townsend passed away. And here uh, you will see that Shoghi Effendi refers to George Townsend as one of the three luminaries of the British Isles. The British Isles is England and Scotland and uh, Northern Ireland and, and, and the Republic of Ireland. This is known as the British Isles. In those days it was and the one national assembly of the British Isles. Today, of course, we have different institutions there. And uh, he talks about three luminaries in the faith in the British Isles. Dr. Esselmont in Scotland, Thomas Brakewell in England, George Townsend in Ireland. And he calls them the three luminaries of the faith of Baha'u'llah. So this is what he says. Deeply mourn, passing Dearly loved, much admired, greatly gifted, outstanding hand, George Townsend. His, his death, moral publication, his crowning achievement, robs British followers, Baha'u'llah, their most distinguished collaborator, and faith itself, one of its stoutest defenders. His sterling qualities, his scholarship, his challenging writings, his high ecclesiastical position, unrivaled any Baha'i Western world, unrivaled any Baha'i Western world, entitled him, rank with Thomas Brakewell, Dr. Esselmont, one of the three luminaries shedding brilliant luster annals Irish, English, Scottish Baha'i communities. His fearless championship cause he loved so dearly served so valiantly, constitutes significant landmark British Baha'i history. So enviable position calls for national tribute his memory by assembled delegates, visitors, forthcoming British Baha'i convention, assure relatives deepest loving sympathy, grievous loss, confident his reward inestimable Abha Kingdom. I think that's it really. This is the book, George Thompson, you can see this written about him. And it's a very interesting. I would like to thank Mr. Tahirzadeh on behalf of the Youth Committee and on your behalf for an extremely complete and illuminating talk on George Townsend and the early days of the faith in Ireland. There are many things said tonight that I had never heard before or I haven't seen written anywhere. So it has been a very special talk. Um, I'd just like to say as well that many of George Townsend's books are available in the book centre and also the letter he wrote to the Christian clergy entitled The Old Churches and the New World Faith is printed in the biography by Mr. Hoffman and it's also to be found in one of the Baha'i World volumes. Um, there's one other thing as well. 
an incident uh, I recall about George Townsend, which demonstrates his humility. And this is that for a period of time, the British NSA was receiving contributions to the fund. And the attached note just said, from the Baha'is of Ireland. And this confused them because they didn't know of any other Baha'is in Ireland. But they established after a while that it all came from George Townsend. So now, um, one of the youth committee members would like to tell you all about upcoming events that the youth committee has planned for you. And after this, we will conclude with two prayers. Thank you.